Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born in Philadelphia, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster graduated from West Point in 1984 and later earned a doctorate in American history from the University of North Carolina. His doctoral thesis was published as Dereliction of Duty, Johnson, McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Lies that Led to Vietnam. General McMaster served in the Gulf War, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. From February 2017 until April 2018, General McMaster served as National Security Advisor to President Trump. General McMaster's new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. H.R., welcome back to Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks, Peter. It's a pleasure to be with you. I should point out, I don't mean to ind indicate disrespect by failing to call you General, but you and I are <laughs> colleagues and friends. And certainly, so, certainly. So, H.R., Battlegrounds. At the turn of the 21st century, the United States was set up for a rude awakening of tragic proportions, close quote. Explain that. Well, well thanks, Peter. What a pleasure it is to be with you, and thanks for what you do to help make accessible to the American public an understanding of these complex issues. Well, I, I think I lived, I lived through this period of time and, and bore witness to a dramatic swing in the, in the emotional impetus behind U.S. foreign policy and, and national security strategy from, I think, over-optimism in the 1990s to pessimism, maybe even resignation in, in the 2000s. And of course, that optimism grew in the wake of victory in the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So you come out of West Point, <clears throat> you come out of the United States Military, military Academy in 84. Right. You're in East Germany, is that right? Well, when, we're on the, on, the West German, on the West German border when in, the wall in, comes in, down. In 1989, when the wall comes down. So five years after you graduate, this titanic struggle that's lasted half a century ends right. in an, essentially in a victory for the West. And not, not a, a huge victory for the West. And, and what was dramatic is you know, living in West Germany and actually with our cavalry regiment patrolling the East West German border and seeing, seeing that scene change dramatically from one moment staring down East German border guards to then you know, thousands, then tens of thousands of people gathering at that border crossing, the gates thrown open, our soldiers being swamped by East Germans with bouquets of flowers and mm -hmm. bottles of wine and there are hugs and tears of joy. And, and so it was a triumphant moment, right? And, and then, of course... And it felt like a permanent victory. Is that it, right? It did. Well, I think it did to many Americans. I think many Americans assumed that <clears throat> really this was a, a fundamental shift in, in, in the nature of, of international relations and in, in the nature of the, the competitive nature uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the world. Um, you know, Charles Krauthammer, who I, I know you know, knew and I think was a, just a very keen observer always, he called it the unipolar moment because he moment. knew he knew it was a moment. But some people assumed right, that, that there had been an arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. And so we, we forgot that we had to compete. And, and I think we became overconfident, complacent, and that complacency and overconfidence, not only based on the, the, you know, the dramatic end of the Cold War, but also based on this lopsided military victory over Saddam's army right. in the 1991 Gulf War. I think it leads to this assumption that a hey, future wars will be fast, cheap, efficient, wage from standoff range. We don't really have to, to compete in traditional arenas of competition in, involving really information and propaganda and disinformation different forms of economic competition we, we didn't really have to engage in because our, our free market economic system w it w was proven. Right. Other alternatives had failed. Right. I mean, Russia was in, it was in a really bad, in bad shape in the 90s. China's, uh, Ch China's uh, rejuvenation ha was not really in full swing. It was the, 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 the opening period of De uh, Deng Xiaoping, but it had not really taken full effect right. in China. And right. so I think we assumed that great power competition was passe, and, and this overconfidence, I think, it was a setup you know, for many of the difficulties we encountered. And so this, this subtitle says it all, the fight to defend the free world. Right. Once again, we have a fight on our hands. A absolutely, we have a fight. And Russia, I'm sorry, uh, sure. you mentioned Russia just a moment ago. The book takes us all around the world. It gives us a lot of history and says, here's what we ought to be concerned with in this region. This re it does go literally around the world. Yeah. This is television, so we don't have time to circle the entire globe. <laughs> right. But let's take a few. Russia. Mm -hmm. 
battlegrounds. I'm quoting you again. In 2019, Russia's GDP was smaller than Italy's, and the United States had a defense budget that was 11 times larger. Mm -hmm. Here's the threshold question. Right. Why do we care about Russia? Right. Well, yeah, uh, because your enemies, right, your adversaries, your rivals, your competitors like, like Russia, they don't, have to, they don't have to compete with you symmetrically, right? <laughs> I quote my friend Conrad Crane in the book. You know, and he said, there are two ways to fight the United States, asymmetrically and stupidly. <laughs> right? and, and you, hope, you okay. hope that your adversary picks stupidly. But, but what Russia's done is they've engaged in a very sophisticated campaign of political subversion against Europe, the United States, and the West. And, and Europe, feel, I mean, it, Russia feels like it doesn't have to be the strongest, right? I think, right. I think Putin wants to be the last man standing while he exacerbates and widens fissures in, in our societies, pits us against each other, reduces our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. Right. And, Another threshold question, again, and from, from Battlegrounds. And here you're writing about a meeting with your Russian counterpart this is shortly after you become NSC advisor. Having, quote, having studied the evolution of Russian new generation warfare, RNGW, which right. you explain in detail in the book, having, having studied Russian new generation warfare for years, I looked forward to talking with Patrushev to understand better the motivations behind this pernicious form of aggression. So, You've already, you've answered why we need to care about them. They don't have to be as strong as we are to do a lot of damage. But this question of motivations, right. what do they want? Why don't right. they want a democratic <laughs> uh, society in right. which everyone right. can prosper How as best as possible? How, How could, could they, they not? not? Why? <laughs> They'd be richer and better and lead yeah. more peaceful lives and have a greater right. country if they lived more the way we do. <laughs> what are they trying to do? Well, I think what has impeded our development of sound strategy of, of impede our ability to compete effectively is we just tend to mirror image the other and we tend to emphasize really commonality of interest and don't give due attention. We don't give due attention to, to how really emotions, aspirations, and ideologies drive and constrain the other. And in the case of Russia, I mean, th those who are in control of Russia now, Putin, and the so-called Soloviki, who he's brought in, right, the former KGB agents and the former security ministry people around him, these are people These who, are guys from the middle levels of the old Soviet operation right. that we defeated yeah. are now running this country. They're running the country. We're facing them all over again. Okay. And, and, and they are motivated. They're motivated by really, really fear and ambition, right? Their, their fear is that this corrupt system that they have built within Russia will collapse. I mean, Putin really, he sits on top of a mafia-like protection racket where those who have gained control of the wealth in the country, the oligarchs, uh, they, they depend on Putin because Putin has dirt on everybody and he keeps them from destroying each other. And in, in exchange for giving them license, essentially, to continue their, you know, their pseudo-criminal enterprises, Putin gets a cut. But the, he gets the cut on kind of a handshake deal, right? So he doesn't, if, if he's not in power, I mean, he, they, he, they might not make good on the promises they made to him. So he wants to keep this, you know, the, this corrupt system in place with him at the pinnacle of power. And, and you've seen what he's, he's done recently, right? Just in, in, in rewriting the Constitution, trying mm -hmm. to create this new role from which he, could, you know, he can maintain control, also trying to remove any kind of term limits on, on power so he can remain in power. The aspiration is to, is to, is to achieve national greatness again for Russia. And, and for Russia to, you know, to, to reassert really its, its influence in, in the former Soviet republics and beyond, and then to be a player in other key regions of the world. For example, as, as Russia has inserted itself uh, in the Middle East and in North Africa. So Vladimir Putin, if we want to understand this man's motivations, we need to think of him as one part old-fashioned czar. He wants to build an empire because that's what Russians do. And well, one part right. Tony Soprano. Well, I, th He's a thug. I, I think those are very good analogies. Those are very good analogies. Okay. So he, he is, Vladimir Putin is not going to be our friend. And so, and so I know people th sometimes think it's really vexing ab about President Trump. Why does President Trump think he can be here. a friend with him? So here he is. You quote him. You quote right. him in the book. You have a, an interview that the president gave in 1982. And he says, calling Russia an adversary is, and now I'm quoting the president, incredible. 
says Donald Trump. Russia lost 50 million people and helped us win the Second World War, close quote. They didn't lose 50 million. The highest estimate I've ever seen is right. 20, 25. Yeah. Still, they lost a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So your national security, forget your time in the White House. Right now, right. how do you say to the president, you've already be begun it, he's not going to be our friend. What do we right. do about Vladimir Putin? Well, I think what we have to, to do is we have to, we have to affect his calculation uh, such that he recognizes he can't accomplish his objectives through continued use of this pernicious form of aggression, this sophisticated campaign of political subversion that employs you know, disinformation and, and propaganda, oftentimes as well, uh, combinations of conventional military force with unconventional military force, as we saw in the annexation of Crimea uh, and, and the invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, and and the, and the employment of these disruptive technologies, especially in cyberspace, the weaponization of social media, uh, but then also certain military capabilities that he's developed, not to replicate our exquisite military technology, but to take apart what he sees as our as our as our competitive advantages. Putin will continue to pursue this strategy again, based on really the you know the, this this sense of offended honor associated with the collapse of the of of the Soviet Union. But and also his ambition, his ambition to be a world player, and and certainly so his ambition. So we can't befriend to, him, we can't convert him. All we can do is adjust the incentives he faces. Well, and we can also look at ourselves, right, and inoculate ourselves against this campaign. We can become stronger. We can be less susceptible to this sort of this effort to polarize our society and pit us against each other. What people don't, I think, sometimes overlook, because so much has been about the attack on the election itself in 2016. Right. The attack on the election was a means toward a, a broader, it, it, just one part of a broader strategy to divide us and, and, to, and to pit us against each other on issues of race. 80% of, of Russian bot and troll traffic originating in the, in the Internet Research Agency, the IRA, uh, in, in, in Moscow was, uh, was, you know, was based on race. And on, on both sides, bastards. The, the, the second, really with a big gap in between race and, and immigration was the next, gun control was the next. So if it's an issue that naturally could divide us, Russia doubles down on it. But what I, what I try to write about in the book, too, is there's, there's a lot of continuity in this approach. I mean, going back to you know, the, the Communist Party in the 1920s and 30s, there was a plan then that they probably pulled out of the, out of the, Kremlin, right. uh, out of the uh, KGB archive and dusted off uh, to also try to affect Americans' confidence in who they are and in our, in our principles and, and, uh, and, and in, our, in our, our identity as Americans. Iran, battlegrounds. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, better known as the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, was to President Trump an example of an agreement in which the United States forfeited its bargaining power and gave away too much for too little, close quote. Was he right? He was right. He was absolutely right. And, and he was right because of really two fundamental reasons. One is that there were just flaws in the deal in terms of try, its ability to achieve its, purchase, its purpose, which is to block Iran's path to a nuclear weapon. Well, it just didn't do that. As you see just in the news in the, in the last month or so, right, you, have, you have Iran saying, well, you can't look at this site, you can't look at that site, you know, to, to the Europeans right. and others and the IAEA. And they did that from the very beginning. The day the, day the President Obama announced the deal the spokesman for the Iranians said, oh, and here's all the places you can't come. So there was, there was poor verification regime, right, and, and, and inspection regime. And then also the sunset clause didn't do anything but just allow them to reap the benefits of sanctions relief, right? <laughs> apply the profits that they made to intensifying their 40-year-long proxy war against us, and, and still maybe be able to continue a clandestine program. I mean, do, I mean, do you trust the Iranians? Who trusts the Iranians? I mean, that, that they're going to do what they say they're going to well, do. Well, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton trusted Iranians. They're the one, and, well, and, and John Forbes Kerry trusted Iranians. Yeah. They're the ones who cut this deal. So is this, can I just, you go out of your way in this book to say, I'm not writing about President Trump. I'm writing about foreign policy, and I right. respect that. Right. And so if you want to bat this question down, bat it down. Mm -hmm. But is this one of those, I get the feeling, and we're friends, we talk to each other, we run into each other at the gym. There are many ways in which you like the guy. Yeah. And as best I can tell, this, is, this kind of gets to it. He could look at something where there was a consensus in Washington and say, no, I'm not going with that. Right. There was a certain kind of animal common sense about, is, I should say, about Donald Trump 
that's right more often than it's wrong. Is that is that the way you felt? Well, I, mean, I think it's it's apparent that the reason why why uh, President Trump was elected is a lot of people felt that they needed a disruptive leader at yes. that point of time. Yes, and he's got the know, guts to disrupt and, and, and things and that need to be there, disrupted. There are no shortage of things in Washington that need to right. be disrupted, right? And and what I try to do is I try to place the Trump policies in context. Of, of previous administrations going back at least at least until 1991, the end of the Cold War. Right. And so just take Russia, for example, quickly. You, you have President Trump saying, hey, if we had a, a good relationship with Putin, that'd be a good thing, right? Not, not a bad thing. Well, that is not dissimilar from Hillary Clinton bringing the reset button to Lavrov in right. Geneva right. You know, or, or President Obama leaning over to Medvedev and saying, hey, I'll have some more flexibility after the election. Right. Or... President George, H., George W. Bush saying he looked into his soul right. Right? and he thinks he really cares about the Russian people. So this is really an element of continuity across three administrations with Putin. And what it says is everybody falls for the guy at first. Everybody falls for the guy. He's an operator. He's an okay. operator. My former colleague, Fiona Hill, has written a great book called, you know, <laughs> Mr. Putin, that an operator in the, in the Kremlin. That's ex exactly what he is. So b back to Iran, if I may. Mm. Um, Explain, first of all, explain to me what, we, what we're doing and then, of course, mm -hmm. what you think we ought to do. Right. And the reason I ask you to explain what we're doing is because it's a little confusing. The president's disposition is clearly to get out of the Middle East, mm -hmm. at least to get off the ground in the Middle East, mm -hmm. get out to end what he and so many others call the forever wars. Mm -hmm. All right. And then on January 3rd, there's a drone attack. Mm -hmm. And we kill an Iraqi, an Iranian general, Qassam Soleimani. We did it in, mm -hmm. I want to make sure I don't get, we did it in Iraqi territory. We did it in Baghdad, right. He, and, and Abu Mahdi al-Mohandas, who was with him. Right, right. right. And that was an, a, a very aggressive mm -hmm. move. Mm -hmm. So what's going on? Are we in or are we out? Is the president withdrawing us as much as he can, but engaging in a very sophisticated fighting retreat where he throws a punch every so often? What's, what's the correct way to understand what's happening right now in the Middle East? Well, I think in terms of the U.S.-Iran policy under the Trump administration, it's based on a, uh, on a set of fundamentally different assumptions from those of previous administrations. Okay. And I think if you look at the broad sweep of US, the U.S. approach toward Iran, you can, say, you can make an argument that I think is compelling, that we have essentially taken a conciliatory approach to Iran, even from the days of the revolution. Right. right. So you have Brzezinski going to Algeria to talk to their, to talk to their uh, foreign minister. What happens? They storm our embassy and take 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. President Reagan thinks, okay, well, they're in a tough spot here in the Iran-Iraq war. We'll sell them some weapons. Maybe when we sell them some weapons, we'll release some hostages. Of course, Iran-Contra happens, and, and you know, really, we, we get nothing out of it except the tanker war. Uh, and, and we also get uh, brutal attacks on our forces in Lebanon, right, where it kills you know, hundreds of Marines and, 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 and kills, uh, kills Americans at our, at our embassy there as well. So that didn't work out. And then if you, if you go forward to George H.W. Bush, in his inaugural address, he said, goodwill begets goodwill. He also released money back to the Iranians to get hostages released. Well, guess what? They just took more hostages. And then Hezbollah goes global, you know, uh, bombs, a, bombs a, a, a Jewish uh, synagogue and, and, a, and, a, and a community center in, in uh, Argentina, you know, destroys a Panamanian air flight. Um, you know, that didn't work. And then, and then 96... They bombed Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia, yes. killed 17 American uh, airmen uh, in, in that bombing. And President Clinton sees, oh, a new president coming in, hot to me. Oh, he's a librarian. He must be a nicer guy, right? I'm not going to conduct any reprisals for that attack. And guess what? Well, that, that didn't work either, right? So I, I could go on and on. The, J, the JCPOA was just doubling down on what historically has been a conciliatory approach with the Iranian regime. And the, that conciliatory approach has been based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the regime. And the regime's permanent hostility to the great Satan, us, the little Satan, Israel, the Arab monarchies, and the West broadly. And so what we did for the president is we gave him options for a strategy based on the assumption hey, the Iranian regime is permanently hostile to the United States. Therefore, whatever policy is in place ought to try to influence an evolution in, in the nature of that regime such that it ceases that permanent hostility. Now, that doesn't mean we do regime change. The Iranian people, obviously, are those who are going to decide, right, right. you know, if this regime continues. 
But in Iran, there's always been this idea, right, that you have the Republicans and the revolutionaries. And if we're just nicer to Iran, the Republicans will gain strength and reform and moderate the regime. But guess what? There was maybe a competition between them, but the revolutionaries won. They They're won. They're the guys with the guns and the they money, won. it turns they out. They have the guns. They have the RGC, the, the, the Quds Force for External Operations. They have the brutal besiege, which killed over 1,000 Iranians in December in, in, in street so protests. So, do you realize how audacious what you're saying sounds? H.R. McMaster walks into the Oval Office and says, in effect, Mr. President, your predecessors, Republican and Democratic alike, going all the way back to Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan have been wrong about Iran. They hate us and they're not going to stop. And Donald Trump says, you know, I sort of thought that was what was going on. Let's get this changed. Is that, that, is that am I, that's roughly well, what took place? Uh, well, it, it, a little bit different from that because, you know, we do have the benefit of high, hindsight. But I think where we go wrong on Iran is in two areas. We don't consider the nature of the regime. And we don't place the latest incident, whatever it is, yes. blowing up oil tankers, attacking Saudi oil fields, cyber attacks, you know, attacking our, our, our soldiers and, and, and forces in Iraq and killing Americans. We don't place it in context of what has been a four decade long proxy war against so, the United States. H.R., here's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at what makes, let's forget, we, we, won't, we can't forget about Donald Trump, but let's set him aside. Mm -hmm. Let's take you, H.R. McMaster. What kind of... What is the psychology of a career officer? What enables you to say, you know, my reading of history, and it's his, it's the, I hear the arguments. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to be yeah. audacious. But my reading of history is that American policy toward Iran has been fundamentally mistaken for three and a half or four decades. Well, for, from my perspective, I think it's more... That can't it's make more, you popular it's, over it's the more, Pentagon, no? <laughs> well, I, I think my perspective is more as a historian. I think you, okay, have to try to, you have to try to understand how the past produced the present as the first step in making any kind of a projection into the future. And, and I think that, I think that uh, historical perspective is invaluable in, in, in policymaking. Okay. And, and, and I think when people don't understand the history, the, the, the culture, how the past produced the present, present what, they, what they tend to do is they tend to mirror image their adversary and undervalue uh, the, the continuity in favor of change. And then maybe have unrealistic faith in their, in their own agency. The other big deficiency... So H.R. McMaster's <clears throat> modus operandi is to stand on the history, read the history, take the arguments from what actually happened in the past. Yeah. And that's where you, so it's not and, and, personal and, and audacity or well, you're not trying no, to be no, George no. S. Patton. No, absolutely it's, not. Absolutely not. And, and this, is not a, this is not a militaristic policy, right? This, right. Is, this is a policy that combines diplomatic, economic, and military efforts, but also law enforcement, financial actions. I mean, if, when you look at what the Trump administration has done, it is an integrated strategy. Now, no strategy is ever implemented perfectly, right? I mean, but the strategy is based really, I think, on a set of sound assumptions. What we did, the, I mean, the process we went through, Peter, is we said, okay, for every one of these situations, we have to understand the challenge to us, this problem set, on its own terms, right? And so I think sometimes people come at these problems with a theoretical perspective, right? I think part of this is, is, is in, in, in uh, academia, right. where there is, is an emphasis on these sort of international relations theories, and then people try to fit these cases into their theory. I think we have to ask first order questions. That's what historians learn to do, right? It's all about the question. Right? <laughs> what is the nature of this challenge to our national security? Understand it on its own terms. And then with Iran, that draws you to the revolution and the effort to export the revolution and the 40 year long pro proxy war. And, and what drives them is their, 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 their desire to stay in power. These are, these are, this is the Supreme Leader right. and the Bonyads and the IRGC. Um, and then the next question to ask them, which is immensely important, is you know, what is at stake? How does this challenge affect our vital interests? And then view that challenge through the lens of the vital interests to craft an overarching goal, more specific objectives, but, but what is skipped in Washington, besides really almost all that oftentimes, is, is, to, is to develop assumptions, especially an assumption concerning the degree of influence mm -hmm. that we have over that complex problem set. We tend to sort of you know, um, 
we tend toward what, what I call in the book strategic narcissism, in that we define these problems in relation to us only, and then we assume that what we do, whether it's intervention or whether it's, it's withdrawal and disengagement, will be decisive to the outcome. And, and we, we only allow the other, the other to have aspirations, right? right. And, and to act in reaction to us. Well, actually, some of the, so they have their own agenda, right? right? And, and, right. And, their, and their own degree of, of agency. Afghanistan, <clears throat> you write in battlefields. Since my first visit to Afghanistan in 2003, you're writing, excuse me, I should set this up. You go back to Afghanistan as national security mm -hmm. advisor. Yeah. And you write of that visit, since my first visit to Afghanistan in 2003, I had felt the emotional impetus behind Afghan policy shift from over-optimism mm -hmm. to resignation and even defeatism, right. close quote. Right. Well, HR, I read that and I thought to myself, why wouldn't we be, begin to feel a little defeated? We've been there for 18 years <laughs> and spent, yeah. you and I had this conversation once. We you, did. Yeah. You can see, you can read all kinds of ranges of figures of how much we've spent in Afghanistan over the years. But the lowest estimate I can find is that in the 18 years, we've spent over $300 billion in Afghanistan. And the Taliban is still there. Mm -hmm. and the government still hasn't achieved control of the country. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't we feel a little defeated? Well, we, we shouldn't feel defeated, first of all, because there is an Afghan government as problematic as it is now with the, the contentious election and both Abdullah Abdullah and, and President Ghani you know, <laughs> having dueling inauguration ceremonies and so forth. But I, I mean, a statistic that's important for people to keep in mind, right? I think the, the recent survey was that 83% of the Afghan people said the Taliban should have zero role, no role in how they're governed. And, and of course, Afghans remember how they were governed from 1996 to 2001. And of course, what brought us into that war is the Taliban giving safe haven and support to Al Qaeda, who murdered nearly 3,000 uh, on September 11th, 2000, 2001. What, what set us up for the unanticipated length, difficulty, cost uh, of the war in Afghanistan was a short war mentality from the beginning. We were going to get in and get out. And so while we can say, hey, we've been in Afghanistan for 18 years, we have fought a one-year war in Afghanistan 18 times over. And, and, and we continue to want to take this short-term approach to what is a long-term problem set, right? And, and, you know, and then we set, at times, unrealistic expectations. Afghanistan will never be Denmark. It just won't be, right? It will only be Afghanistan. And I thought what was important and what we did for the president was to give him an option for a sustained long-term approach to Afghanistan that was sustainable, and then also an, an ability to explain to the American public how the risks that their son and daughters take in that war, and how the sacrifices they may be called on to make, and how the cost of that war was contributing to an outcome worthy of those costs, those risks, those sacrifices. And I think we did that. I think we did that. And But 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 there, there there's come back into the discourse, this belief that it is a futile in endeavor. Okay, right. hold on. For uh, two quotations. The first one is you from Battlegrounds, H.R. McMaster. One of the assumptions foundational to America's fantasy in South Asia, now here you're criticizing the wrong way of thinking or the mistaken way of thinking, was that the Taliban, even as it gained strength and the United States withdrew, would negotiate in good faith and agree to end its violent campaign. That's quotation number one. Right. Here's <clears throat> quotation number two. I believe they really want to make a deal. I think after 19, actually going very close to 20 years, they're also tired of fighting, believe it or not. But if, if it takes said, more troops to keep the Taliban from taking over Afghanistan, is that something you would be willing to do well, or no? Well, you know, there's a big question about the government of Afghanistan. There's a big question about that whole situation in Afghanistan. We're getting along very well with everybody. We have to get our people back home. It's not fair. We're a police force over there. We're maintaining things. Eventually, we have to leave. We don't want to stay there for another 20 years. We don't want to stay there for 100 years. We want our people to come back home. OK. You had the president where you wanted him. So, no, no, no. We, what, how do you <clears throat> No, we, no we, we, we had the president where he wanted to be. So what we, what we did is we showed the president a wide, wide range of options. I yep. believed it was my job as national security advisor not to advocate for a policy, right? right? Okay. But I, my mm -hmm. job was to give the, the elected the president won. options, right? right? Right. Which we did. And what I believe is that 
what we what we determined at the time, which was the, the one of the fundamental flaws in, in in the Obama administration approach to Afghanistan, right? To say, hey, we're leaving, and we'd like to negotiate, you know, right. a deal that's favorable to us. That that we replicated that same that same that same flaw, right? War war really is a contest of wills, right? And 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 the the president's speech that he gave, I think, in September of 2017, I think, really bolstered our effort psychologically. I think we should, everybody should recognize those who are bearing the brunt of the fight, not only against the Taliban, but also against Al Qaeda in that region, also ISIS Khorasan, and the other 22 or so U.S. designated terrorist organizations that thrive in that ecosystem, or that terrorist ecosystem between Pakistan and, Af and Afghanistan. Afghan forces are bearing the brunt of that fight. They're, they're, thousands of their soldiers are dying. Uh, per year. We're enabling them, we're supporting them at, I believe, a cost that is, that is sustainable. What we did is, I think what we did is, recently, in recent months uh, with Afghanistan, is, is replicate that same sort of tendency toward wishful thinking, right? Right. To, to define your enemy as you would like your enemy to be. So I, I would just ask the question, you know, what, what does power sharing with the Taliban look like? Does it look like bulldozing every other girl's school? Does it look like mass executions in the soccer stadium every other Saturday? And and then, of course... So, HR, what, if I may... <laughs> I'm imputing... I, I'm, no, so, again, so, let's set the president to yeah. one side. He finished speaking by saying we need to bring our troops home, and there was applause. Of course and there would so be. Of course there would. And that's, so the American people... No. Is, uh, here's the, the argument is, look, uh, I understand it's been that. 18 years and 300, 400, who knows how many tens of billions of dollars we've spent on those people on that country in Afghanistan... It's their problem now. Mm -hmm. Let the Afghans bear the full brunt. It's yeah. their country. Two decades yeah. is enough. Bring them home. How do you answer that, well, that, it, that understandable it, impulse? It is their problem now. It is their problem now, but it's unclear that they can do it on their own, especially when you consider a safe haven and support base in, uh, base in Pakistan and the efforts of the Pakistani ISI. And to if they can't do it on their own, to, it costs us. Well, no, it costs us less and less because over time what has happened is that we, we've been able to build up, I think, the resiliency of, right. of Afghanistan. Even though more and more territory is contested, it's imperfect. You know, the president alluded to, you know, the government has problems, but, you know, I, I prefer Ashraf Ghani, right, to, to Akhenzada, you know, the, the leader of the, of the Taliban, in, in terms of the person to back. And what we did in recent months is we had this really strange, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, shift in our thinking in which we started to partner with the Taliban, yeah. under the illusion that partnering with the Taliban could help us achieve peace. But you asked a question, which is a good, qu important question. Why do Americans care about this, right? Right. Well, first of all, it's important to remember that those who committed mass murder against us on September 11th, 2001, were the so-called Afghan alumni, right? They were, the, they, they were the alumni of the Mujahideen resistance to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan from 1980 to 1988, okay? The Al-Qaeda, the various other groups, you know, uh, alumni, are now orders of magnitude greater. This is already a multi-generational problem. Should the situation in that region deteriorate further, you would have the Taliban in complete control of an extremely lucrative territory research, resources personnel and, and people, but also a very lucrative drug trade that will fund their, their operations, not only, uh, you know, locally, but also against us, because these groups are not monolithic or homogeneous or separate from each other. From each other. You know, a great analyst on, on uh, Afghanistan, a guy named Tom Jocelyn, who mm -hmm. writes for the Long War Journal, mm -hmm. he said, we have tried too hard to disconnect the dots. And that's what we've done um, in, in Afghanistan. We've created, in large measure, the Taliban we want, right? Right. right. All right. H.R. <clears throat> China. Again, two quotations. Here's Jimmy Lai, the Hong Kong publisher and democracy activist, just arrested on, uh, mm -hmm. in Hong yeah. Kong. Right, right. Quote, President Xi, president of China, President Xi is arguably, arguably the most absolute dictator in human history, mm -hmm. more absolute than Mao, because Xi has artificial intelligence. Yeah, right. H.R. McMaster, writing in Battlefields about a trip to China as national security advisor. Quote, Xi's outer confidence masked a sense of foreboding that he might suffer a fate similar to that of previous rulers, close quote. So here we have China. Right. Is Xi the most absolute dictator in history, mm -hmm. or is he running scared? Yeah.
Well, I think it's both. And I think the fear that he feels, right, the fear that, 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 uh, that his rule, that the Chinese Communist Party's rule could come to an end, is what drives much of the behavior internal to China and externally. Now, of course, with, you know, with the, the Nova coronavirus and, and uh, the, the, the pandemic, uh, it's put even more pressure on, on China. But what China has done is they have taken extraordinary measures to extend and tighten the the uh, the party's exclusive grip on power. Right. They have and and can those, I just those, can I just yes. I'm sorry. So this is in your book, but I can here's a here's a sum, quotation that sums it all up, mm -hmm. and I'm sticking it in because it was by, by Harry Rowan, who's the late foreign policy yes. expert and a Hoover yeah. fellow, yes. colleague of ours. Right. He wrote in 1996, quote, "When will China become a democracy? The answer is around the year 2015." This prediction is based on China's impressive economic growth, which in turn fits the way freedom has grown elsewhere in Asia. Close quote. Right. China was supposed to follow the pattern of South Korea and Taiwan, where economic growth leads to political freedom. That's right. And it was not a crazy mm -hmm. idea. Right. But it didn't happen. Did How happen. come? It didn't happen because of ideology. And emotions that drive that drive that drive the party, and and one of the this is one the, of the theme. aspects of this, this is story. the theme. We're dealing with people who aren't like us. It is, and so I make the case. I use historian Zachary Shore's term: we need strategic empathy. We need to understand the, these competitions from the perspective of the other, right? And and we fail to do that oftentimes, or we don't pay enough attention to it, maybe. Now, there was, reason, there was some reason for optimism, right, in the, in the 1990s. I think it's important to understand that our approach toward China prior to the end of the Cold War was mainly to balance against, against, Soviet. against the Soviet Union. Yes. And, and this is when, when, uh, when uh, President Nixon uh, and, and Secretary of State Kissinger, National Security Advisor Kissinger, initiated triangular diplomacy. The idea was we will have a better relationship both with, with China and with Russia than they have with, the, with each other. Right. After 91, that's when we saw the, the, the assumptions really kind of come to the fore that China, if we welcome China in to the international economic and political order, China, China will, will liberalize. It'll liberalize its economy and play by the rules. And then as China prospers, it will liberalize its, its form of governance. Well, it's done the opposite, right? It has doubled down on a statist economy that, 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 that uh, engages in a wide range of, of economic aggression that disadvantages our companies and our workers and, and, and also, I think, is aimed at, at, at dominating the emerging data economy. We could talk more about that and gaining a differential advantage over the U.S. militarily uh, as well. Uh, and it has done the opposite of liberalized its form of governance. It has created an Orwellian police state. You know, uh, in 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 China, far beyond what Orwell imagined in in the novel 1984. Okay, so you, China is the game. China, China is what matters. I'm trying to. I'm summarizing what I take to be your argument. So correct me if I've got it wrong. Whereas, Iran is a problem. Of course, it's a problem. But it's a country of 60 million people that's very poor and riven with factionalism. Putin has a huge land mass, but he has an economy the size of Italy's, and it's based on extractive industries. All he does is sell oil and natural gas. Yeah. They don't make anything anybody wants to buy. And on China is different. They lifted six or 700 million people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. They have legitimacy, even from a humanitarian point of view, hundreds of millions of people who used to be dirt poor now lead materially comfortable lives. And they've done it with a system that is very different from ours. Mm -hmm. So it's a country that's huge, rich, powerful, wants to be number one, and has a certain legitimacy which even we cannot gainsay. Correct? Well, legitimacy I think that is purchased oftentimes and, and, and a, a legitimacy that is based on what I've described in, in the book is, is co-option, right? Co-opting co others. To, to buy into the relationship with China, once th those those countries or companies <laughs> are co-opted, then China coerces them to, to support China's world worldview and to support its its objectives, and then and then the key strength for China is it conceals its nefarious activity and tries to portray it as normal business practices, and and I think each of these problem sets that you just sort of uh, you just uh, summarized here 
require a different set of, 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 uh, of solutions, right? And, and really, never going to really solve them, but we, we need to compete more effectively by really integrating all elements of our national power with efforts of like-minded partners. And so the, the key, the, there are three sort of themes that run, that run through the book. The first is the recognition that this is a competition. And the second is that we have to improve our strategic competence, and in particular, understand better how the past produces the present, and pay more attention to, to ideology and, and, and emotions that drive and constrain the, the other. And the third element is confidence, right? confidence in, in who we are as a people, but also to focus inward, right, and, and to strengthen our economy to, and to, to strengthen and, and, and preserve our competitive advantages in, in, te in technology and education in particular. Let me ask you to grade one aspect. <clears throat> well, no, I'll put, I'll put it to you. I'll put it to you that I think there's a, I'll, I'll grade it. And you tell me if you think, if you approve of my grade. We've just discussed since, since the 19, I served in the Reagan White House and it, the hope yeah. then was that China, as China became economically more successful, economic freedoms lead to political... Okay, so it, right. this goes way, way back. Right. And it hasn't worked. And here's what Donald Trump has accomplished. He may have used trade as a kind of crude tool to stand up mm -hmm. to the Chinese. It's hard to know what other tools he had, short of military options. But three and a half years into the Trump administration, the notion that China is an adversary is now universally granted. Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders would all admit that we have a competition on our hands with China. Oh. And the idea that this administration has shifted the national consciousness mm -hmm. on the question of China, that represents a major achievement in itself. Am I waxing a little too? I think you're absolutely right about that. I, th do. I think it is the most important shift in U.S. foreign policy since the, since the end of the Cold War. And I wouldn't say ad adversary. I would say strategic rival, which is what we wrote in the 2017. You don't want to get too tough on them? Why? Well, why? no, no, because I think by competing, that's our best chance in ensuring they don't become an adversary. I think what we had done in the past under the so-called strategy of strategic engagement and the assumption that they would become, to use Bob Zulick's term, you know, a responsible stakeholder. And I'm not blaming anybody in the past. I'm just saying that there, the, those assumptions on which those previous policies were based were demonstrably false by 2017. And so we required a new set of assumptions, which I outlined in the book, as the foundation for this new, this new strategy, this they new policy. They were demonstrably false by 2013, 2014. No, absolutely. And, absolutely, and yes. Donald Trump had the yes. guts to stand up and say yeah. so, right? Is that, I mean, he, yes, he, yes, yes. He was, he was absolutely right about this. Okay. And what, what, what I think is important here is that I think this is one of the many policies and strategies of the Trump administration that, guess what, surprise, has bipartisan support. Well, that's okay. Right? Okay. I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> so here's the, here's so, the next question. Uh, so, so last questions here, yeah. and here's one of them. He's, he's, done, he's, he's standing up to China. So far, the only tool that seems to come to hand is trade policy, but he's got the American people understand we're in a competition. I'll use competition, your word. Yeah. If you look at the previous Cold War, Harry Truman stands up to the Soviets, and then Dwight Eisenhower continues the policy. Mm -hmm. It becomes bipartisan. Right. In well, Eisenhower shifts, he, less money on, on boots and more money toward nuclear power. And there are shifts and nuances and so forth, that get adjust, but it becomes a bipartisan project on the part of the nation. Right. for four and a half decades. Right. So what is the prospect that whoever succeeds Donald Trump, whether it's Joe Biden next January mm -hmm. or someone unknown five years from now, yeah. what is the prospect that a Democrat will, will what? Will somehow or other stand up to China as firmly as Donald Trump has? Will we develop new tools other than trade? How? Do, how mm -hmm. Well, to what yeah, extent does yes. this become a national project rather than a Trump project? It already is a national project, I would say. It already is. There's tremendous support for this on the Hill, for example. And on, it, in both in parties. In both parties. And it's an integrated strategy, right? So, so what got everybody's attention were the trade enforcement actions, tariffs, yes. put in place on China, really in large measure to get their attention, but, but also not just on 
non barrier tra- te- uh, you know um, barriers to entry to their market, right. but the full range of predatory and, and aggressive trade practices, you know, the forced transfer of technology, sensitive technologies, and intellectual property, you know, the um, the support for state enterprises. Now, the, the phase one deal didn't take care of all this, but what else did you see? Okay, now, you know, the, a lot of people think, okay, well. Hey, this administration, because of the, the phrase "America First, which I think is an unfortunate phrase, you know, to, to, because of the, 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 the historical analysis of the, the 30s. 30s yeah, right, right, right. Um, but but they think, well, there's not there's not multinational co- cooperation going on. The U.S. and Japan are working together extremely well on on the, this whole problem set. Uh, so is the, the you know the so-called Quad uh, with uh, with with Australia and add India to that across the Indo-Pacific region. Other countries in the in the region, from the ASEAN, most of the ASEAN nations, they they want American participation and leadership on confronting China's unfair trade and economic practices and China's attempt to create servile relationships with their with their with uh, you know with their neighbors. The European Union has called the European Union even right has called China a systemic competitor. And so, uh, if you go, think about uh, December two thousand eighteen, I think it was, the United States Department of Justice. And the Justice Department's, or their equivalents, of 12 other countries simultaneously indicted and or sanctioned APT-10, which is the main Chinese Communist Party hacking organization got it, got it. that is engaged in a sustained campaign of industrial espionage against all of our countries. All those countries acted together in an unprecedented and really underreported you know, uh, incident of right. multinational cooperation. HR, you're being very careful to steer me to the correct language. They're rivals, but they're not yeah. adversaries right. because, mm-hmm. all right. Graham Allison of Harvard, mm-hmm. he has in his uh, last book, he writes about the Thucydides trap, which right. he claims he finds in Thucydides himself. Yeah. So this goes back, mm-hmm. what, 2,500, 2,800 years. Right. Here's the way Graham Allison describes it. When one great power threatens to displace another, war is almost always the result. Close quote. And in battlefields, you're careful about this. Some have argued that competition with China is a Thucydides trap. Close quote. Well, isn't it? No, it's it's not. Okay, so I, I think our policy ought to try to avoid the extremes, you know, of war. Right and passive acceptance of Chinese aggression. Right, but, but a, and, avoiding war means preparing for it, does but it not? It, it does. It does. It means preparing for it. It means deterring your enemy. What I argue in the book by denial, which means convincing a potential enemy that that enemy cannot accomplish his objectives through the use of force. So this means, if I may go back twenty, thirty years, this means that the, Peace the guys over this in is, the Pentagon right. have to be just as careful about understanding. Chinese capacities today and 10 years from now and 20 years from now in the sea and in the air and in the space and making sure that we have programs Absolutely. in place to counter them just the way we countered the Soviets in the old days, right? Absolutely. This, this is, is hard, serious this is, work. This is Reagan-esque peace through strength. All right. That's what this is. And, but, but that's only one element of the competition. So I think we try to describe this as the three C's, right, of competition. And to look at competition as the best way of avoiding confrontation and also not foreclosing on cooperation. Because to deal so- with something like this pandemic, you have to have multinational cooperation. There are clear areas where our interests overlap with those of Chinese, the Chinese leadership and, and, and China. For, for example, I, I, don't think, I don't see any way that you know, in North Korea with a nuclear weapon is in China's interests, right? right. For, for example. So we ought to be and able yet to cooperate. they've permitted it to happen. Well, they've permitted it to happen, They right? could take that guy out. They, they, they could resolve that problem themselves. In fact, you know... It, it, you I, must I think, have had some testy conversations with... Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now I'm going where I know you can't answer questions. So, HR, let me, let me sum up the China, and then I want to move to a couple of final questions about you, China. They have 1.3 billion people. We have 330 million. Right. They're four times bigger than we are. Mm-hmm. Their economy may soon, it depends on whom you listen to, but their economy oh. may soon be bigger than ours. Mm-hmm. And they have a central government which is odious in all kinds of ways, but that sure. can get things done. Right. And we have this rickety old system that a constitution that's 230 years old has given us. Mm-hmm. And it gives us all kinds of inefficiencies but we have a free market and democracy. 
how optimistic are you? How yeah. confident are you? Right. All we have is freedom, which really, I suppose, in military and strategic terms, right. what it means is we have a chance to stay ahead of them, to out-innovate them mm -hmm. permanently. Can we? Yes, we can. If we're not complacent and if we compete, we certainly can. We have tremendous advantages in our system. We have democracy, right, which means that we can correct ourselves short of a revolution. Right? You mean to the tell people, me the people have in the say, Trump White House and watching that operation get vilified every single day, the dysfunctions within the Trump White House itself, you mean to say that you came out of that with your faith in democracy intact? Of course. What's the alternative? Look at the Chinese Communist Party. Just look at the pandemic outbreak, right? First, denying it happens. You know, trying to shut down the, 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 the doctors who are trying to, to sound the alarm ab about the pandemic. You know, mishandling it horribly in the, in the beginning and you know, squelching any kind of, of public outcry uh, or, or, or attempted social pressure to get the government to do better and then demanding that people pray Xi Jinping for, Xi Jinping for the way he handled it. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost ludicrous, right? But it's You'll not You'll still ludicrous. take us over so, that. Well, of course. And I, you know, I have a section in the book where I talk about turning what our adversaries, our, our strategic competitors, our rivals perceive as, as our weaknesses. How do we turn them into our strengths? And I think we can, we can turn them into our strengths. I think if you look at the situation in China now, what China has done to try to leapfrog the United States, essentially, I think has created tremendous frailties uh, in, in, in their system. And, uh, and, and we, don't want, we don't want China to fail. I mean, the, the Chinese Communist Party narrative is like, look, you're trying to, you're trying to keep China down. You're trying to contain this. No. Of course we not. Just want, we just want Chinese Communist Party leadership to play by, to play by the rules. right? And, and we can no longer stand and be victimized, right? And the Thucydides trap it poses this false dilemma again between war and just passive acceptance of, of Chinese aggression. I think if, if we compete, I'm, I'm very confident that, that, we can, right. that we can prevail in that competition, uh, but do so in a way that doesn't threaten China, right? We, we, that hopefully maybe incentivizes China that they can accomplish what they need to accomplish without doing it at our expense. All right. HR. You're an unusual bird. Your first book, Dereliction of Duty, examined the breakdown in, decision in the decision-making process during the Vietnam War, and that book is now required reading for young officers in the United States military. And at the same time that you're a historian, a careful historian, a well-read historian, someone who can de deploy historical arguments in the case of in, in the in the cause of making an argument about what, what we ought to do today, at the same time that you're that, you are a warrior. This cover picture is not a joke. You can be a very rough guy. Twenty three minutes in Iraq during the first war, you and your tank unit destroyed eighteen. How, what was the number of tanks? It was, it was a twenty three minute yeah, battle. Right. You it was destroyed a lot, it was the opposition yeah. mm -hmm. and took not a single casualty. How do you pull off these, this, these two aspects of your life? Well, you're retired now from the military, and yeah. so the scholar you are from here on out. I guess that's the yeah. way that works. But during your career in uniform, I don't imagine that a lot of your fellow officers were as deeply... I don't imagine that what you did in your spare time, so to speak, was a source of... They didn't respect it probably too much, did they, or did they no, not? No, we did. It was just did, HR did, sort yeah. of eccentric, or let him do his, no? <laughs> no, no, I think, I think it's more representative than you'd think. I mean, I, That's what I was, I'm getting I was, at. Are, yeah, I was, I how was, how atypical yeah. were, are you? I'm not, I'm not atypical. I mean, I don't, I don't believe I am. I mean, I was given this great gift. I was given the gift to be able to serve my country alongside men and women who are willing to give everything, including their own lives, for you in units that take on the quality of a family, where people are bound together by, by mutual respect, common purpose, being part of something bigger than, than yourselves, and, 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 uh, and they're, they're bound together really by what becomes affection and love for, for each other. I mean, uh, I, I found every day serving in uniform immensely rewarding. I mean, I, I really did. And you know, I think today there, there's a sort of popular perception of the experience of service in, in our military that is skewed a bit by Hollywood, which I think tends to, to cheapen and coarsen uh, the, the, the military experience. Uh, and then also really, you know, a, a belief by Americans who really see, you know, the, the, the suffering associated with war, especially with our, 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 our soldiers and servicemen and women who are, who are killed or wounded in action. Um, 
but the, and and I, I and I think our soldiers are, are grateful for you know for their for their um, sympathy and so forth. But I think I think really soldiers really don't want to be pitied, right? I mean, I, I think I think soldiers want to be valued, you know. So and, last question, then last question, which yeah. flows from this one. It's possible to argue that this country hasn't won a war since the Second World War. Stalemate in Korea, failure in Vietnam, which you wrote about, only a very messy peace in the Balkans, Afghanistan, still f the fighting is still going on, mm -hmm. Iraq, you could call it a functioning democracy, but that would be by a pretty minimal definition. Mm -hmm. And here we face, as you've just told us, a long, uncertain rivalry, let's say, with China. So what do you say to a kid who's 18 or 19 and thinking about a military career as against the glittering possibilities in this e private economy of ours, which yeah. is now much richer than it was when you were 18 and yeah. making that decision right. to go to the academy. Right. What do you say to a kid about this strange world where you don't seem to win outright victories anymore, yeah. but you can sure make money? Yeah. Well, I think, I think you have to focus on the less tangible rewards of, of, of service, right? And, and the fact that you are part of something bigger than yourself. And I think today, uh, America's warriors are both warriors and humanitarians, as they always have been, right? I mean, it was a, it was in many ways a humanitarian mission, right? To to defeat Nazi Germany, Absolutely, to defeat right. Jap uh, right. Imperialist Japan, to to defend South Korea. I would say that's a war we won. Okay, look at look at South Korea in 1953, which makes the argument for why you, it's important to take a long term approach to long term problems, right? Hey, South Korea in 1953, the country was completely denuded, right? After it was, it had gone through decades of, of war. There were no natural resources in the country. You had an illiterate population and, and a corrupt government, right? And a hostile neighbor. I mean, look at South Korea now, right? And, and so I think that, you know, if you, if, you, if you understand that victory in war is achieving a sustainable political outcome, consistent with the vital interests that brought you there to begin with, then you can recognize how to consolidate military gains and to integrate all elements of national power to achieve that outcome. I think that's where we've gone wrong in, in, in recent years. And this has, I think, a lot to do with Vietnam, which is the subject of my first book, right? Which is, you know, the, the, the pain of, of Vietnam created the Vietnam syndrome, right? right. Which really, the, which was really, I think, it, in many ways, kind of a warped lesson in that war, which means, hey, we just never want to do any of that complicated stuff again in war. And so we began to define war in an ahistorical way that divorced war from politics, that divorced war from the human drivers of conflict, you know, fear, honor, and interest with Thucydides identified you know, 2,500 years ago. War is uncertain because of the interaction of the enemy. How else do you explain, right, when you announce a, a reinforcement of soldiers to Afghanistan, you announce their withdrawal table at the same time? How does that affect the outcome right. in a way that's positive. And then, of course, war is a contest of wills, which is important in terms of demonstrating your will to defeat an enemy. But it also has to get to, it gets to the, the question of national will, what you showed with the, the clip with President Trump and people applauding the withdrawal of Afghanistan. What the American people deserve and what our servicemen and women deserve is a description of what is at stake in this conflict. Why do they care? Why is this important to American security, prosperity, and influence in the world? And then what they deserve is they deserve a description of a strategy that will deliver an outcome that is at an acceptable cost and risk that accomplishes those objectives. The American people deserve to have the argument made. Absolutely. Which you have done in Battlegrounds, the fight to defend the free world. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure to be with you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson.